Welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 248th episode, our guest is Robin Bernstein. Robin Bernstein is the Dillon Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies and Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Harvard University. She is the author of Racial Innocence, Performing American Childhood from Slavery to Civil Rights, which won five awards. Her latest book, Freeman's Challenge, The Murder That Shook America's Original Prison for Profit, was released from the University of Chicago Press on May 2nd, 2024. And now on to the show. Hello, I'm Robin Bernstein, and I am the author of Freeman's Challenge, The Murder That Shook America's Original Prison for Profit. Very interesting book, uh, very interesting, pertinent subject uh, that still has a lot of echoes today, obviously. But um, I wasn't familiar with this case before I read your book. Um, So maybe if you could just kind of in the broadest terms, talk a little bit about, um, you don't have to talk about the the court case part of it necessarily first if you don't want to, but maybe just set the scene in terms of, uh, you know, where we are and, and what we're talking about here. Sure. This book is about how the North invented profit-driven incarceration. It is slavery by another name. It was a way that the South used um, the law, the 13th Amendment, in order to re-enslave African Americans after the Civil War. And it is true that prison for profit was invented as a form of re-enslavement and that it was invented in the wake of slavery. But in fact, it was invented in the wake of Northern slavery, not Southern slavery. So my book is about America's original prison for profit, which was the Auburn State Prison. And it, um, it, it, was, it, it was created in the North in the early 19th century. And I'm telling the story of who these people were who invented prison for profit. And I tell the story through one person, William Freeman, who was an African-American and Native American youth, a teenager, who was incarcerated in America's first prison for profit for a crime he swore he did not commit. And he pushed back, he resisted America's original prison for profit. And so I tell his story. Yeah, and um, it was interesting to read about the uh, differing schools of thought in terms of, you know, what would be the best way to administer a prison. And uh, this is something I uh, kind of became interested in after, I don't know if you've been there before, but I visited the uh, Eastern State Penitentiary in uh, Philadelphia. Have you have you been there? I have not been there, but I certainly know about it. Right, yeah. Um, and there's, you talk about this in the book, but there's kind of two schools of thought here in terms of, you know, how to administer a prison. Um, can you talk a little bit about the differing, you know, the kind of the Pennsylvania uh, style and and this style and how they differed? Sure. So if you're going to have a prison, there are a number of different reasons that you could do that. You could create a prison in order to reform people, to help people become better people. You could create a prison for the purpose of control, which is to say basically to get people off the streets. Or you could create a prison for the purpose of generating profits for private companies and or for the state. And prior to the Auburn State Prison, prisons had existed mainly to punish people. Um, so that's another uh, possible call, uh, possible goal of a prison is to punish. So prisons had existed basically to punish or to reform. And the Eastern State uh, Penitentiary, the the pencil, the so-called Pennsylvania system, that was a system that was aiming to reform people. So then the Auburn system came about in New York State with a radical new idea, which was that uh, reforming people didn't matter. Even punishing people didn't really matter. That wasn't really the point. The point of the Auburn State Prison was to make money and to make money for private corporations and for the New York State in order to save money on the prison and actually to make money, to, to, to turn a profit. So the Auburn State Prison was in opposition to previous carceral systems. It was a radical new idea. And one of the, the points that I want to make in this book 
is that the radical ideas that were hatched by a group of white businessmen in Auburn, New York in the very early 19th century, those ideas now govern all prisons all over the world. So simply the idea that a prison can and should be an economic force, that was an idea that actually had a beginning. There, that's, there's nothing inevitable about that idea. That idea began in a small town called Auburn in New York State. And I'm looking at where that idea came from and how radically different it was from the Pennsylvania system that you mentioned, which aimed to reform people, and also from previous systems that aimed to punish people. This was a radical new idea. Right. Um, I will say, though, that being in the Eastern State Penitentiary was a, a if I, I don't usually think places are haunted, but <laughs> if any place is haunted, that definitely <laughs> qualifies. Um, and, you know, we now know more about the effects of solitary confinement on people. So while that, you know, compared to what you're saying about just free prison labor, basically, um, you know, sounds like an, an improvement on that. And it's more focused on on reform, I guess. Uh, it's it's still it's not a perfect system by any means. Oh, goodness. No, no. And actually, let me talk about some of the specifics of the Pennsylvania system versus the Auburn Please, system. Yeah, definitely. So the Pennsylvania system was invented by Quakers who had a sincere desire to reform people. But they had a horrific idea about how to do that. Their concept was that if you had a wrongdoer, a criminal, what you could do is basically take that person and put them in an individual cell, that is to say solitary confinement, and just leave them there with a Bible. And they would have nothing to do but read the Bible. And then eventually they would, if they read the Bible and were affected by it positively, they could get small amounts of piecemeal work to do. So they could do some work in their cell. And so the concept was they would read the Bible, it would Christianize them, it, they would do work, the work would discipline them, the work would help teach them good work habits. And these two things together would enable them to become better people. So in, um, in the Pennsylvania system, people were working and they were manufacturing things and those things actually were being sold, but the purpose was reformation. Now, of course, what we know is that solitary confinement does not reform anybody. Solitary confinement is a form of torture and solitary confinement causes uh, mental illness, it causes suicide, it is, um, it is terrifically inhumane. But the concept behind it was, um, was, was well-intentioned. And my book is full of individuals with the very best of intentions who do horrific things, including torture. So meanwhile, the, um, the Auburn State's uh, prison had a different philosophy, but it also involved solitary confinement, but for a different purpose. So in the Auburn State Prison, every single prisoner was placed in a solitary cell every single night. So they were in solitary confinement every single night. And again, this is torture. Then during the day, in contrast to the Pennsylvania system, in Pennsylvania, people were in these solitary cells permanently, and which is a horrific thing to contemplate. In, at, at Auburn, they were in these cells every night, and then during the day, they worked in factories, which were built into the prison, and they were working together in these factories. However, they were not permitted to speak ever, and it's very hard to take that in, take in the, the enormity of that. They were not permitted to speak at all Ever. The only exceptions were when a guard spoke directly to them and asked them a direct question, but otherwise they were not allowed to speak. And they also were not allowed to look at each other's faces ever. So you, in, in theory, you could spend all your time in the Auburn State Prison and never speak a word and never look at another human face. Now, of course, people did find ways to communicate and they did find ways to look at each other's faces. But doing that incurred enormous risk because the Auburn State Prison was a very violent place 
where prisoners were beaten horrifically and whipped and also waterboarded. And the purpose of all this violence and the purpose of the extreme social isolation, believe it or not, the purpose was not punishment. The purpose was productivity. The purpose of this silence, the purpose of the solitary confinement, the purpose of the violence was to force people to work in these factories, to force people to manufacture consumer goods that were sold throughout the Northeast. So in the, so the, the Pennsylvania system and the Auburn system had some commonalities, both involved uh, solitary confinement, both involved work, but those, um, those practices were for completely different reasons. And the most important commonality between them, of course, was that they both involved torture. They were both profoundly inhumane. And they the two systems were in a rivalry with, with each other where each one would point to the other and say, we're so great, they're so brutal, they're so inhumane, but we're so fabulous. But of course, this was just a way of distracting from the fact that torture was a foundation for both of these systems. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up the... Uh torture because uh that was pretty uh horrific to read about the uh what what was that called where they poured the water on their head yeah that was um that was a form of waterboarding and it was called the shower bath so yeah. this is a this is a great example of how some of the individuals that i write about in this book some of the ones with very good intentions ended up doing horrific things so the Auburn State Prison uh, practiced whipping as a form of, of control and violence. And then at a certain point, some people felt that whipping was brutal. Whipping seemed like, um, seemed Southern. And this was a point of Northern pride. They wanted the prison to be a specifically Northern style of prison. And whipping seemed like, seemed, seemed too connected to Southern slavery. Remember, this is at a time when Southern slavery still exists. And so a group of, of white Northerners decided that they needed something that was more controlled and more humane, but still an effective means of, um, of control. And so what they came up with was a machine that could perform waterboarding. And they called it the shower bath. Now, what we know, of course, is that whipping is a form of torture and waterboarding is also a form of torture. So they created this horrific machine called the shower bath and then congratulated themselves on how civilized it was and how humane it was. But this is just another dodge. Um, in fact, torture is torture and it is always wrong. Yeah, um, and that definitely gets us a little bit of the ways to talking about William Freeman. And, um, you know, I, I think that more the more we understand brain science and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but think of uh, CTE um, when I read the description of what happened to him, you know, and the, and the permanent effects that uh, the kind of blow to the head that you know, can, can give. Uh, talk a little bit about the the torture he received in prison and uh, how that might have affected his, you know, later actions. Yeah. William Freeman resisted his incarceration and his forced labor from the day he entered the prison. So it's important to talk a little bit about who William Freeman was and why he valued his freedom so highly. William Freeman was um, part of the most prominent black family in Auburn. He grew up in Auburn. He grew up right near the Auburn state prison and he was the grandson of Harry and Kate Freeman, who had been enslaved and who had been forced to build uh, the foundations of Auburn. And while they had been forced to build white Auburn, they were simultaneously building black Auburn. And they established the black community, which was called New Guinea. So Freeman grows up as the grandson of these revered um, people in town, and he's part of a small but vibrant Black community, um, and his his grandparents were enslaved, his father was enslaved, his grandparents became free, his father, they called themselves, they named, which tells us what was important to them, what they valued, 
they could have named themselves anything. They could have named themselves after their former enslavers. Lots of people did that. But no, this family chose to name itself Freeman. And William, the grandson, was the first um, freeborn member of that line. And so he grew up free. He was part of the first fully free generation in New York State. And this was really important to him. So he is um, accused of a horse theft in 1840, which he swore he did not commit, but it didn't matter. He was tried, he was convicted, and he was sentenced to five years hard labor in the Auburn State Prison. He was furious. And he was most angry about being forced to work, as he put it, for nothing. He was angry about this, the theft of his labor, the fact that the Auburn State Prison was organized theft disguised as justice. So he's put into this prison and he is forced to work. He is put to work in a factory that manufactures animal harnesses. What he was doing specifically was filing iron. So 12 hours a day, he's filing iron to make it smooth for um, as a preparation for being turned into an animal harness. And he's very angry. So he refuses to work. And he also works slowly when he is forced to work. And he um, works poorly on purpose. A lot of people are doing this. And as a result, he gets singled out. Um, he talks back. Remember, he's a teenager. Um, he talks back and he is whipped and he is waterboarded. And then during a particularly horrific event, a guard beats him over the head with a board that is four feet long. And the guard hits him so hard with this board that the board splits and William Freeman sustains a catastrophic head injury. Um, as a result, he becomes deaf. He loses most of his hearing and he never regains it. And he also has a brain injury. Right. And then, of course, the reason that, you know, we know about him today and the reason that he became famous was this uh, murder, uh, well, mur several murders. Uh, talk a little bit about that case and also about the trial, because it was interesting to see how prominent of people got involved in that. So. William Freeman resisted his incarceration. He resisted his forced labor. He resisted basically his enslavement. Um, while he was in the prison. And then when he got out of prison in 1845, he continued to resist the theft of his labor. He got out of prison and what he, his position was that he deserved back pay, that he had been forced to work for nothing, as he put it. And that was unacceptable because he was not a slave. He was a worker. That was his position. So he tried to recover back wages. And for six months after his release, he worked to get back pay. He worked to get it legally. He appealed to magistrates and he was try and he talked to everybody he could talk to, to try to get what he saw as the money that was owed to him. And he was laughed at and he was dismissed and nobody listened to him. And then he resorted to violence. And that is the murder that is in the title of the book. So he committed a horrific act of violence and then laughing at him and dismissing him was no longer an option. At that point, people had to deal with him, but they did not want to hear his critique of the original prison for profit, the Auburn State Prison, because the Auburn State Prison, remember, its primary goal was to make money. And it did do that. And it made money not just for the, the corporations that were setting up these factories inside the prison. It was actually making money for the entire town the, and in the entire region and the entire state. Um, it was Auburn was basically a factory town where every single person, every single business in one way or another had economic ties to that one big business, which was the Auburn State Prison. So when William Freeman critiques the and challenges the Auburn State Prison, and he challenges it in a way that he can no longer be dismissed or laughed at, he has to be taken seriously, but nobody wants to hear 
his challenge to the prison, which is providing their prosperity. And not only is the prison providing their prosperity, it's also a sense of identity. It, it defines the town and it was making the town internationally famous. The Auburn system was being replicated all over the country and all over the world. Some of the best known prisons in the United States were all built on Auburn's model. So when you think about Parchman or, um, or Angola or San Quentin, these were all prisons that were built on Auburn's model. And there were hundreds more. So nobody wanted to hear this challenge to the Auburn State Prison. And so they had to come up with a different story for why William Freeman did what he did. Because if you want to suppress an idea, you can't simply silence it. You can't do that. What you have to do is you have to come up with an alternative story. I mean, you could silence an idea when it was expressed in a magistrate's office. But once that idea is enacted through violence, it cannot be simply silenced. So they had to come up with an alternative story for why William Freeman committed this murder. And the story that white people in Auburn came up with, of course, was that William Freeman committed violence because of race that it wasn't about the prison, it wasn't about the theft of his labor, it wasn't about the fact that perhaps prison for profit is inherently wrong. What they did was they blamed his race and they they created these racist, um, these racist narratives that now are very familiar to us. But one of the points of origin for some of these narratives was actually his trial. So, in his trial, he was um, he was defended by William Henry Seward, who was at the time best known as the governor, the former governor of New York State. Later, of course, he would become um, Abraham Lincoln's secretary of state, and he would broker the purchase of Alaska. So if you've ever heard of Seward's folly, that was this William Henry Seward, who was William Freeman's pro bono lawyer. And meanwhile, the prosecution was John Van Buren led the prosecution. And John, uh, uh, yes, John Van Buren was the son of Martin Van Buren, the past president. So these very famous people got involved in the case, which tells you how high the stakes were. William Freeman had challenged the economic engine of New York State. And so these very powerful people got involved to manage the situation. And what both the prosecution and the defense argued was that William Freeman committed this act not because there was anything inherently wrong with the prison, not because there was anything inherently wrong with prison for profit, but he did it because of race. And so this idea that this racist libel, that there is an inherent essential biological connection between black raciality and crime, that racist idea had one of its points of origin in the trial of William Freeman. And they it was the prosecution and the defense who both came up with this idea, which had the effect of muffling the challenge to the prison. And so this set of arguments about race then got amplified throughout the United States because the the trial was such big news. The trial made national headlines and the arguments that were made in the trial by both the prosecution and the defense were nationally distributed. And when that happened, what was being distributed was a relatively new emerging set of racist ideas. Well, uh, you you can just draw a straight line from that to I uh, just watched uh, or rewatched the uh, documentary Thirteenth, mm -hmm. and um, you know, of course, this happened pre the Thirteenth Amendment, but uh, we you know still have prison for profit more than we ever have in this country, and obviously, uh, you know, the idea of black male criminality uh, being inherent is uh, goes hand in hand with that. Um, 
So, I mean, it was, it was, you know, striking just how many similarities and how little has changed uh, in the, you know, almost 200 years since the events yeah. of this book. So a lot of people have said that to me. A lot of people have said that it's uncanny how familiar the story that I'm telling is. And I think part of the reason for that is that my book is really about the origins of some of our most familiar ideas, like the idea that a prison should be an economic force, the idea, the racist idea of supposed black criminality. These ideas are very deep in us right now. And so the fact that um, the events in the book seem so familiar, so contemporary, it's because this is our origin. This is where some of our ideas were embedded in our heads 200 years ago. Yeah, and, um, you know, the the people who, uh, you know, are saying these things are obviously very motivated to be saying these things and uh, willing to turn the, uh, you know, the attention anywhere other than the actual source of the problem. Um, you also talk about... Uh, uh, the guy who uh, brought the paintings around and had the shows talk, talk a little bit about that. And also the press, you know, uh, way of describing uh, this at the time in newspapers and elsewhere. Yeah. So the, um, th as I said, the, the, the trial got very big, very fast. And basically what William Freeman committed was an act of terrorism and people were terrified and then they needed to manage their terror. So one way to manage the terror was through racism, through uh, blaming blackness itself, and which is a really good way for white people to avoid looking at themselves, for white people to avoid looking at their own crimes. So they, they blamed blackness, and then these stories got amplified. So you were just referring to um, these paintings. Um, one of the ways that the racist arguments of the trial got amplified was through theater. And there was um, a man named George Maston who came up with this really spectacular theatrical production where what he did was he had giant paintings commissioned of the actual murders. So this was a series of four paintings of the actual murders um, painted on these canvases that were like 10 feet by 12 feet. They were absolutely immense. And then what he did was he hung these paintings up in um, a church social hall, for example, or a local museum. And he, in a nighttime performance, he stood in front of these paintings in a dark room with a candelabra. And he held the candelabra up to the paintings and he narrated the events. So, he, And while he was doing this, he had assistants who were playing music. So it was sort of a proto-filmic kind of live performance. And this was terrifying. This was a terrifying kind of performance. And he went on the road with this around New York State. And he performed with these paintings. He performed with his candelabra and his musicians. He performed for almost half a century. So this is one of the ways that the uh, William Freeman's story, as told through the racist trial, was disseminated. Um, it was also disseminated through press coverage. It was disseminated through fiction. People fictionalized the story. And in all of these narratives, what was happening was it was becoming less and less about the prison, less and less, and not, in some cases, not at all, about what William Freeman actually had to say, his very important challenge. And it became more and more um, an opportunity for racists to make racist arguments. One really interesting thing about the book that I found that I hadn't really considered before was that there's some pretty prominent, uh, you know, figures on the abolitionist side who you would expect would speak up about this at the time, you know, the, the prison for profit system and, and basically legalized slavery in the North, um, being, being relatively silent on the issue, uh, you know, Harriet Tubman and, and, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass are two notable examples in your book, but talk a little bit about that and maybe why they chose not to, you know, pick that fight. Yeah. So when we think about some of the most prominent abolitionists from the period, a lot of them were connected in various ways to Auburn. 
So um, Frederick Douglass had, prior to William Freeman's um, uh, trial, Frederick Douglass had never lectured in Auburn, but he had lectured very close to Auburn, um, but he had never shown any interest in Auburn. And, um, and there were a lot of Black abolitionists who were lecturing around Auburn, but Auburn was not especially important to them. But then after William Freeman's trial, all of a sudden, everything changed. And all of a sudden, a lot of Black abolitionists became very interested in coming to Auburn and telling their own stories. But what they didn't do is they didn't talk about William Freeman when they came to Auburn or elsewhere. They didn't talk about prison, prison for profit. What they did was they really came and they talked about Southern slavery and they talked about their own experiences. So in some ways, what they were doing was not continuing William Freeman's challenge, not taking up his mantle. On the other hand, what they were doing was really talking back against the trial. The trial had distorted Freeman's case so terribly and had turned it into a referendum on blackness itself. And what Frederick Douglass and a lot of other abolitionists did was came and told their own stories, claimed their own histories, claimed their own humanity, and did that in the very place where William Freeman had been dehumanized. One of the really fascinating uh, parts of this story is that um, shortly after William Freeman's trial, Harriet Tubman moved to Auburn and she bought land and she bought land from the wife of William Henry Seward. She bought land in Auburn that was two miles away from the Auburn State Prison, and she lived there for the second half of her life. She lived there from about 1857 until her death in 1913. So this is really fascinating to think about. The great emancipator who spent her life devoted to liberty and freedom ends up choosing to live two miles from this new form of unfreedom. And to me, what that speaks to is the contradictions that we all live with. Um, no matter how devoted any of us are to freedom, we are all touched by unfreedom. And in particular, one of the properties of the prison industrial complex is that we are all touched by unfreedom, no matter how much we want it to be otherwise. A great example of this is um, in New York State today, the Auburn State Prison still exists. It is now called the Auburn Correctional Facility, and it is still defined by factory work. And specifically, what is manufactured today in the Auburn Correctional Facility is license plates. 100% of New York State license plates are manufactured in Auburn's prison. They are manufactured by men who are literally walking in William Freeman's footsteps. And so if you have ever seen or uh, seen a New York state license plate, if you've ever owned a car that has New York state license plates, you are that close to the prison labor of people like William Freeman. Right, and um, we just have a few minutes left, but I, I did wanna ask you as somebody who writes about people who lived so long ago and we're in living in such different circumstances and, and there's scenes you write about that obviously you have to take your best guess at and still try to be respectful as you can to the truth. How did you go about that writing this book? Um, you know, cause I mean, to make it come alive for people, you kind of have to, you, you have to do a little bit of improvising, I assume, just to like, you know, fill in the blanks for people between the cold hard source material of yesteryear and, and today. So talk a little bit about that process, because I, I just think that's interesting. Well, I actually invented nothing, um, nothing at all. It was very important to me to tell a truthful story. And I wanted the book to be a great read. That was really important to me. I wanted to write a book that people would not be able to put down. And that was part of the reason that character is so important in this book. William Freeman, I wanted him to come alive. I wanted his challenge to come alive. I wanted us to be able to really hear his challenge. 
characters like William Henry Seward and um, and 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 um, John v um, Van Buren. I wanted all of these people to live on the page, and I wanted the book to be an incredibly compelling read. Um, at the same time, I was absolutely I was absolutely clear that I was not writing a novel. Um, there is no fiction in the book at all. Every single fact in the book is based directly on a primary source, um, and it's all in the footnotes. So there are moments of conjecture in the book, but I always identify them very clearly. So you never have to wonder. If I say this person's eyes were blue, that person's eyes were blue. If I say at this moment, this person may have wondered, um, then I am um, using conjecture, but I'm identifying it very carefully and very in a very straightforward way. So every single word of the book is based on fact. And when there is conjecture, there's no question. It's it's right there in the text that it's it's conjecture, but there's very little of that. The book is true. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, um, you know, like you point out in the footnotes, you kind of have to go with you know, if you don't have somebody's particular story, you find somebody similar to them, right? I mean, that's the only way you can do it because not everybody's life story. I mean, heck, there's people you talk about in the book that like, um, like his sister, you, you say, you don't, we don't even know is her name. She was just, you know, referred to with, you know, certain adjectives and that's about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot that we don't know. So um, it's true. Uh, William Freeman had two sisters. He had a sister named Caroline. And then he had another sister that is never named anywhere. And when the family refers to her, they always refer to her with um, a word like foolish. They, they refer to her as being foolish. And it seems quite likely that she may have been mentally disabled. Now, do I know that? No, I don't. Um, I, I say it's likely. I don't know. And I don't know her name. So I let that be an absence in the book instead of, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not going to, you know, invent a name for her. Um, I'm Instead, we're going to feel the silence around her name. The fact that we don't know her name and maybe someday um, something will come to light and we will know her name. But right now we don't. Right. Well, um, I Definitely think we could talk for much longer here, and I definitely uh, would love it if you came back sometime uh, to talk again. Um, one question I do always ask before we go, though, is uh, what music have you been listening to lately? Oh, goodness. I'm a terrible nerd when it comes to music. I like musical theater. Uh, I probably shouldn't admit that. People, are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm a musical theater nerd. I listen to a I'm whole a lot of Stephen way. Sondheim. I, I so much musical theater in the car driving with my mom to school. I've, I've heard it all, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my jam. That's my thing. What's your, uh, what musical are you listening to most recently, would you say? I actually recently listened to um, Sunday in the Park with George, which is one of my favorites, and I know all the lyrics, but recently I got a hankering to listen to it yet again, and I did that. Nice. Um, my wife and I, before she became my wife, uh, we went and got, uh, saw Sweeney Todd, mm. and I was not aware that that was a musical before we went to go see that movie, because obviously I'm not I'm up on the musical, but then I like the opening scene, Johnny Depp like starts singing something, and I'm like... Oh, wait a second. Is this a musical? <laughs> like I was not expecting that. So I feel like a lot of them. And of course I have kids now. So all the Disney movies are musicals. So I'm, uh, I'm getting more steeped in musicals every single day. So <laughs> well, that is a good thing. <laughs> definitely. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you for, uh, for being here and uh, definitely everyone should check out your book. I have uh, been definitely uh, learning a lot. So thank you so much. This is a pleasure. And if you invite me back, I will very happily come back. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Talk to you. Thanks so much. Bye -bye.